I was 10 years old, I played my violin for a memory care facility that my mom worked at. And as I started to play my simple pieces to practice my stage fright, a woman in front of me started to vocalize. I wasn't quite sure what was happening at the time, but afterwards, a nurse approached me, and she explained that that woman had been non-vocal for four months, and she was a former opera singer trying to sing along. I continued to play with this woman until she passed a few months later, accompanying her. And this meant so much to me that when I was 14 years old, I started the Day by Day Project, a volunteer student organization to bring my orchestra into different memory care facilities. And as I went into these facilities week after week, I realized I was starting to form really strong bonds with some of the people that were living there. One of them was with a woman named Miss Charlotte. And Miss Charlotte reminded me a lot of my own grandmother, and probably because she was so funny. She would tell these stories until I would literally be laughing so hard that tears were streaming down my face. And every day, I would go back to see her and make a straight V-line, and it didn't take long for me to realize that Miss Charlotte could not remember me. And Miss Charlotte couldn't remember a lot of the people that she cared about. I didn't know what to do with this, and I didn't know how to process it, and I almost had to walk away from this work because it was so hard. But at those same visits, I could see how music could turn that gloomy, sad room into something beautiful, with color, colors streaming through, and people were connecting, and we could alleviate some of the hardships of dementia. And so I kept coming back and coming back, until eight years later, the Day by Day Project is now an official 501c3 nonprofit that's dedicated to transforming dementia care through music. I invite you to walk through the world of dementia with me. At the center is a person that is struggling to recognize the environment that they're living in and the people around them. So naturally, they begin to withdraw. But that withdrawal is so detrimental because it actually speeds up their rate of cognitive decline. And at the same time, we have memory care facilities that are oftentimes understaffed, struggling to care for the basic needs of a person living with dementia, let alone providing adequate life enrichment resources to really fight this cycle of withdrawal. And then we have care partners and loved ones that are tasked with grieving the person that they love and caring for them at the same time. And without a way to connect, this often manifests in caregiver burnout and depression. And so here we are, looking into the world of dementia from the outside, and we're seeing the strong cycle of withdrawal. And without a cure, we need to find a way to support the people that are struggling today, each and every day. So let's talk about music. Have you ever been in a car when a familiar song comes on that takes you right back to a different time and place, when all of these emotions and memories start flooding in? That's because when we tie memories to music, they're rhythmically encoded in our brain, in a different area. And these are called musical memories. Musical memories can help us remember things like our nursery rhymes or our ABCs when we're little, but they also can play a key role in a lot of our core memories, like the first song at our wedding. But musical memories serve another purpose, and that's that they're preserved throughout dementia, meaning that even when a person's cognition, language, or movement decline, they oftentimes will still be able to connect with these memories. This is Bruce. Bruce was a former music man tried and true. He played in multiple bands, he was a conductor, a composer, and he even played that instrument that I'm convinced is two instruments because it's a keyboard and a guitar, but I've been told lots of times it's just one. And Bruce was incredible. I had the honor of meeting him through the later stages of his disease progression, when his movement, his language, and his cognition had severely declined. So we could oftentimes find Bruce in a corner with not much on the walls, keeping to himself where he felt safe. But Bruce was withdrawn. But when we would play Frank Sinatra for Bruce, he would stand up, lift both his hands to the sky, and you could see through his eyes that the music was flowing through his body as he would begin to conduct again. And he would share this moment with whoever was around him, whether it be his family members or the volunteers that we brought in that day. You see, Bruce is an excellent example that even in the later stages of dementia, when we think that we can no longer recognize a person, they're still there. We just need to find the right way to connect with them, and that's through music. Music needs to be at the center of dementia care. And so we created the Memory Disco program. The first part of our Memory Disco program is our neuroscience-based musical engagement program. When I first started using music, 
I could see how different things that I would do could elicit different responses, like feet tapping or people singing, moments of awareness and awakening, and I became obsessed. I wanted to know everything and why it was happening, what was happening in the brain, and I had the honor of working with a neurologist, Dr. Rana Schatz, who's the head of memory care at the University of Cincinnati, and she taught me that there are three therapeutic ways to engage with someone that has dementia. Rhythmic engagement, physical touch, and community involvement. And she worked with me for the past eight years to develop a musical engagement program that encompassed all three of these simultaneously to maximize the power that music has on the brain. And for a long time, what we were doing is training our volunteers on these musical engagement techniques to work hand in hand with a person living with dementia. And we would bring in live musicians as our source of music. But during COVID-19, we could no longer bring live musicians in. And so I didn't know what to do. I knew that these people needed this more than anything else during isolation, but I felt stuck. I remembered back to my high school after prom, where we had a silent disco. And if you're not familiar, a silent disco is an experience where an unlimited amount of headphones are connected to one music source so that everybody's listening to the same music at the same time through headphones. Silent discos are used in after proms or raves or big music festivals, but they had not yet been used for the needs of the dementia community. So I thought, let's give it a shot. And what we saw was absolutely incredible. At that first event, people were standing up on their feet and they started dancing. 96-year-olds were dropping it like it was hot. <laughs> And everyone in that room was filled with tears because of how moved this experience was. And all I was thinking is, why is this happening? Why is this different than live music? Why can't we just play the music out loud? We figured out that there's three reasons. The first is attention. When a person is diagnosed with dementia, their attention span gets really small. And we can only engage in activity as much as we can put attention into it. So it really limits what they could do. But when we wear headphones, it automatically engages 100% of whatever attention span we have, maximizing the power that music has on the brain. In addition, each headphone's volume could adjust independently, meeting everyone's unique hearing needs, which is a major limiting factor of engagement within this community. And last, my job became so much easier. I no longer needed to rely on live musicians to bring our musical engagement program into communities, because now we could bring the power of music into any place, at any time, by anyone, regardless of their musical ability or access to live music. And so here's a video of our memory disco. Pretty awesome, right? It's seeing those moments happen. Um, and we were able to see them again and again, and it was so easy. So what I was thinking is, what if we could reframe, what if we could push it and reframe music as not just this fun, lively activity, but as a tool for care partners to use each and every day? And what we did was me and my team interviewed care partners to understand their needs and the challenges that they faced each day. And then we ran a two-year pilot program to see how music could fill those gaps and fix some of those problems. And what we found was that music could help. It could help with ryth rhythmic eating during times of mealtime. It could help during sundowning. It could be a tool for de-escalation. And we could even hook a microphone up so that everyone could hear bingo a lot better and make that more engaging. This is only a few of the problems that we were able to fix and what became later known as our many memory discos. So let's take another look into this world of dementia. But now, the person that was once withdrawn is able to connect with their environment around them and the people around them. Memory care facilities that are understaffed now have a tool that with one staff member, they can engage up to 30 residents at a single time in an engaging group program. And now care partners have a way to connect and and recognize each other again by playing familiar music. As you can see, music can play a huge role in the dementia community, and it can really help the people that are struggling today. 
But how can we, as a society, make music more accessible in dementia care? We can have volunteer organizations that connect young people with this, with this community. A lot of times, people are kind of nervous about stepping foot into the memory care scene because they're not sure what to say or what to do, which is completely understandable. But now, through music, we can take away that barrier of language and that barrier of asking and knowing what to say because everyone is listening to the same music together. And they're connecting by shaking maracas and holding hands and dancing. And, they're make, and everyone is on the same level playing field in this experience, ready to make new memories together. We can also make music more accessible by reframing it as this tool, which puts the power back into the hands of care partners. We can provide the equipment, resources, and education needed to really help them implement music into their daily care routine. And last, now that we know the power of music, and a lot of us know people that are affected by dementia, we all have the ability and the responsibility to start conversations about changing the future for dementia care and including music to make it an accessible part. But at the end of the day, this is not just about music. This is about connection. Music is the avenue of connection. It's the universal language. It's the way that even when dementia takes everything away, we can still have something. And maybe Christmas and Thanksgiving look a little bit different this year because grandma and grandpa are dancing in the living room with their family. And memory care facilities now have a tool in their back pocket when they need an engaging group program or a moment of de-escalation. And I hope that every one of us agrees and can see how music can be an accessible part of dementia care. In this way, we can continue to create new memories in this condition that is so often characterized by what is forgotten. When I was 14 years old, and I looked Miss Charlotte in the eye and knew that she could not remember me, I didn't know what to do. Honestly, I felt hopeless. Um, but that was because, at the time, I thought that the point of life was to go through it and collect all these memories and store them in photo albums in our brains so that one day, when we get old, we can sit back in our rocking chairs and share them with the people that we love the most. Isn't that what life's all about? And here I was, looking with Charlotte in the eyes, this incredible woman, and knowing that she could not recognize the people that she loved the most. And not just her, one-sixth of all people over the age of 65 had that ability stripped from them. I realized that memories were not guaranteed. And in order to keep moving forward and doing this work, and honestly, thinking about life itself, I had to reframe how I thought about memories and dementia and life. And what I came to was this, that perhaps the point of life is not to remember it all in the end. Maybe it's to live for others and know that our memories will live on through them. And in the same respect, we all have a responsibility to remember those around us, those that are sitting here today, those that are eating dinner with us tonight, and share their stories, like of Miss Charlotte and Bruce. Because this way, for as long as they may forget, we know that we will always remember them. Thank you.